Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming back. Now, let's go on with a tutorial on IPv6. Now, Wesley Correa, an old friend of ours at the Casa de Internet uh, for many years, has given us support at many courses, webinar, and podcast. Uh, he is uh, a professional trainer, and he's going to speak about IPC. Thank you, Wesley. So, let's share the presentation. Thank you all for coming. We are now going to talk about uh, data centers, IPv6 only, come sit uh, DC, CIIT DC. I wasn't here this morning, but I was at the LAC Peering Forum. I was there with a presentation on peering and IPv6, so I couldn't be with you, but I'm sure that you received a very good introduction on NAT64 and all these transition techniques. <clears throat> Once we need to do the IPv4 to IPv6 transition as soon as possible because of the deployment of the implementation of IPv6 wherever possible. Now let's talk about the data centers that are also a very significant part of the networks. As a matter of fact, it is where all the information is stored. And why is it important for us to have data centers today working on IPv6? It is that the more data centers, the more servers, the more web services available in IPv6, we're going to be doing two basic things. Number one is favoring IPv6 traffic, that is increased IPv6 traffic at present, an average I, uh, ISP has about uh, 70 to uh, 75 or 80 percent or even more in native IPv6. And the more servers we add with IPv6, the more that traffic will increase and more interesting it will be for users to have IPv6 and to have access to IPv6 only contents. And the second reason is that when we use or we implement resources of native network resources of IPv6 for data centers, we'll be saving IPv4. And you're all aware that IPv4 is a scarce and very expensive uh, resource and the more we can save the more we'll uh, be able to use uh, the very few uh, IPv4 resources remaining this is a presentation I gave uh, in the past that you, and you can download it from LACNIC where it says tutorials in the agenda you can download that presentation so that you can have it as additional material in that uh, presentation, this is what we, we're going to talk about concepts of how to have uh, IPv6 only data center using IPv4 to IPv6 transition techniques. When we have a data, serv a data center or a web services that are IPv6 only, for legacy networks to access these servers, we'll need transition techniques. And those would be those uh, transitions just as NAT64 that makes it possible for IPv6 networks to access IPv4 networks and IPv6 does it the other way around. Using, by, using uh, transition techniques, you can have servers that are exclusively for IPv6 to be accessed uh, 
with legacy with IPv4 legacy networks. Whenever I treat with IPv4, I'm going to speak of legacy networks because, as a matter of fact, IPv6 is already the internet standard protocol, and everything should be in IPv6. So let's start talking about uh, SIT. That is um, as stateless uh, IP ICMP translation is standardized by RFC 2765. The protocol consists of translating with no state storage between IPv4 and IPv6 networks as reflected in the name is a translation protocol both for ip packets and uh, for the icmp protocol and that's interesting because when we are pinning in an ip4 address that is in a translator uh, sit that address is not assigned in any uh, network uh, interface but the sit uh, translator from my uh, to IPv6 and sends it to the server and the pin for the user is transparent. That is, the user that's sending a re echo request in IPv4, that IPv4 doesn't exist, is not configured anywhere. The, the response is a result of translation of ICMP to IPv6, and that's very interesting. And here you have an example of how that would work. To your right, we have a, a, a network that is 100% IPv6, and to the left, uh, it's 100% IPv4. The machine here in the middle of uh, the screen translates. It's a relay. That machine is responsible for sending the packets from one side to the other. But how if we are using two different, if we are executing two different IP uh, stacks? So the server is operating as a route by default. It receives and routes uh, the packets from one side to the other. However, there is a reference table that says that for each IPv4 address, I have an IPv6 address that is especially assigned. That will be the IPv6 address that I will route uh, that uh, packet that comes for IPv4 to. The packets that come to IPv4 will be uh, routed to IPv6 uh, addresses related in that table, and the IPv6 to IPv4 packets are also routed using the existing um, addresses. So that relay is responsible for the translation and at a data center, for instance, in the implementation of a data center, it would be responsible for receiving all the re requests of IPv4 and converting them into IPv6. That may sound a bit strange. Uh, the concept may sound queer. Now, there, uh, let me tell you that there are very large data centers that uh, are IPv6 only. A very well known social media has an IPv6 only data center using SIT for data centers. That is, all their services are in IPv6, and the users that are still legacy. They are users that have IPv4 only. They go through a translation process. And here, let me open a parenthesis to tell you something that you may not have realized yet. If for the user in IPv4, the server in IPv6 uh, arrived and occupies a translation, that means that that user will have a worse navigation experience than the user that is in native IPv6 that won't go through any translation processes. Did you, were you paying attention to that? So, if we want to deliver the best quality possible, the best experience possible to users, we'll have to do our best. 
delivering IPv6 to users so that they will be able to originate the connections directly on IPv6 and not in IPv4 uh, going through a carrier gray NAT or, or any other thing and routing through the internet and reaching the data center and going through another translation. So e in each translation and the traffic, we are worsening the user's feeling of connectivity and the user's navigation experience. And in the end, what we want to deliver our users is experience. So, speaking of SIT for data centers, well, this SIT for data centers is standardized by RFC 7755, and it does the same that we saw for SID only that it's an implementation that is focused on uh, the concept of data centers. In the previous scenario, we can use uh, local uh, networks, uh, business uh, networks, and everything works in the concept of data center. We are going to have a connectivity like this. In that chart, we have the server of the data center, the virtual machine that is executing a web server, for instance, and they have only an IPv6. It has external conne uh, connectivity that is external to the internet in IPv6, uh, but it has absolutely no IPv4. Here we have the border relay, the BR. In that BR, we have an EAM chart and table that we where we have the reference from an IPv4 to an IPv6, and with that, the user that is, has. IPv4 only can access the web server of IPv6 without even realizing that it's going through translation. So, with this, we can uh, make the data centers grow only configuring a family of IP addresses, that is IPv6, and we leave the everything that is IPv4 to provide access to legacy networks in uh, the border relay. In this case, for instance, what are the advantages? Well, in the server with uh, IPv6 only, there is no need to have dual firewall uh, uh, rules for IPv4 and IPv6. If we've only configured IPv6, there's no reason why we should have firewall rules for IPv4. We also have some uh, uh, convenient aspects including that users can have access directly through IPv6 and have advantages of not going through translations. And, of course, we, uh, well, the networks will uh, turn into IPv6 only networks. So those are advantages of implementing the data centers in IPv6 only. An interesting curiosity for BR, that is for the border relay, for that IPv4 that we'll have here, we'll have a DNS entry in IPv4 only, even when if we execute the dig command, we are going to test it, you and you are going to test it with your users. As soon as we execute the dig command, that address or the domain address, we are going to see that we'll just, we're just going to have a response A. However, the web server is executing IPv6. And of course, for IPv6, we can also create a quad A entry. So to sum up, so that the web server can be accessed both through legacy IPv4, going through the border relay, or through IPv6, we will set up two DNS entries. One is a quad A, 
specifically with the IPv6 address that has been set up in the web server and another entry for the border relay for the IPv4 that has been set up at the border relay. The mapping is done based on RFC 6052. So what do we do with that mapping so that it works? We reserve a slash 96 range that encompasses the entire IPv4 address space. With that range, we carry out the mapping. And why slash 96 if we take away 128 bits from an IPv6 address or from the total amount of IPv6 addresses by 96, we're going to have 32 bits. So the 32 bits can encompass the entire range or all the existing IPs in the IPv4 range in one single slash 96. And that is how we carry out the translation process. The same border relay can direct traffic to different web servers and services in the same data center. So with that aim, we do EAM, which is explicit address mapping, which is an explicit mapping between IPv4 addresses and IPv6 addresses. In other words, when an IPv4 packet reaches an IPv6 specific IPv6 addresses, we are requesting opening an 80, port 80 or 443 for a given uh, specific IPv4. So when that packet arrives, automatically a translation to IPv6 takes place, which is stateless. And that packet is forwarded internally at the data center so that the connection is generated from the IPv6 server and from the device that is being accessed in IPv4. It's totally transparent. This diagram shows an example of how this would work. The device that you have at the top left, which is 203011350, wishes to send a packet to this other device or to a web server that is only executed in IPv6. On the left, we have IPv4 only. On the right, we have IPv6 only. The originator of the packet is 203011350, which is a station on the left. And the destination of that packet is not a destination in IPv6, it's a destination in IPv4. If it were in IPv6, that connectivity could not exist. It wouldn't, it be, would be unrecognizable. So this 192.0.21 is a border relay. This is a server in charge of doing the translations of the packets and the connections between IPv4 and IPv6. Now, when this packet reaches the border relay, automatically the header is of the packet is changed, and this becomes the IPv6 address of the border relay, and that packet is then forwarded to the web server. Now, everything is in IPv6. The response packet is originated directly at the web server in IPv6 and is also forwarded to an IPv6 address, which is the address of the border relay. So you see here that in this example, in the suffix of the origin address, we have 2030113.50, which is the address, the origin address of the host that initiated that connection. So this information goes together with the IPv6 and precisely is contained in the last 32 bits of the IPv6 address. So always 
we will have that information of the IPv4, of the 32 bits of the IPv4 address encapsulated in the remaining 32 bits of that IPv6 address. And when responding, the web server sends from the origin IPv6 address 2008 1 DB8 1 2 3 4 colon colon 1 to the IPv6 address also because from IPv6 you cannot have direct communication with IPv4. So this is the IPv6 address 2001 DB8 46 colon colon 203. Point zero one one three fifty. So when this packet reaches a border relay, the border relay is in charge of eliminating the IPv6 portion in the address at origin and destination and reviews the mapping to forward the packet again to the destination address, which in this case now is the station in IPv4. So once again, the user does not realize that this is taking place. The user doesn't realize that this process exists. And when the majority of you access a given social network, you don't realize that that exists and then that is, and that, that is happening. But exactly that is what is happening. In this link here, well, a couple of hours ago, that web server stopped working, but it will be available for you to check. So in that link, we you have all the material, all the commands executed in that laboratory, but we'll see command by command how this works in the Debian implementation. So we're going to use a Joule now. Joule is a Mexican beauty. It was developed by Nix Mexico together with the University of Monterrey. With the University of Monterrey here in Mexico. And from my standpoint, this is the best implementation we have for 464XLAT, for SIT, which is based on free software. You don't have to pay any license. You just have to have the Linux, download the software, the source code, and everything will work perfectly well. And there are implementations that already use Joule for SIT and for 464XLAT. So let's take a look at the laboratory. This laboratory, I'm going to show you a part of a laboratory that we already showed in other versions of this tutorial, where we showed 464XLAT. This laboratory is composed of the following. I have an external connection here, an internet connection that I reach at this border. Can you tell me what kind of router this is, anyone? What kind of router is this? What vendor is this? I think it's a CCR1026. Well, it's a MicroTIC. So many of you are already used to MicroTIC. And you will see here that we only need to do routing. So we have this machine here, which is our SITDC, and the web server in IPv6 only. Let me now open. So I will do the following. So this is then easier for you to see. SH Debian 
etc. Please don't do any DOS attacks. This is a global IP. So I'm here now with SSH. Uh, let me check whether this can be viewed properly. So I will close this window. This is so that you can see this better. All right. This is the vendor of the machine. It is one that does the SIT. It's a common Debian with Joule installed. I'm going to type history so that we can have the commands used to pick up the Joule instance. So once we have the Joule installed, you can check the installation commands for Joule in that link, which will start to work shortly. This one over here. So after installing the Joule, you need to do a mode pool Joule SIIT, Joule SIIT instance add net filter pool six. And here we're going to put the definition of the pool of the slash 96 pool that we're going to use for the translation processes. 96 pool will encompass all the IPv4 addresses, all the existing IPv4 addresses, because we have 32 additional bits available. And in the third command, what we're going to do is a Joule SIT EAMT add an IPv4, which is the IPv4 that will receive the packet, whether IP or ICMP, and the IPv6, which is the IP responsible for receiving the translated packet in the web server in IPv6. So having done that, everything is working. Now, a curious fact, fact, and let me regulate this now. A curious fact is that here we have SIP over here, which is a private IP that goes through port redirection so that that port can work and so that you can obtain the access. Now, if we take a look at the IP address, the addressing table, IP address show. This address, 192.168.250.18, does not exist here. What we have here is a IPv4 address, 192.168.250.6.30, which is the IP address of EPNIC. EPNIC. So, in that interface, in S3, we have an IPv6 of EPNIC. And if we do bind, ping, sorry, we do ping 192.168.250.18, that address is not configured anywhere. But it does receive ping. Now, let me do something. Let's try and see if I can once again open this over here. Two eight zero four.
let's uh, ping here and uh, let's let it work and here we can see that when we give the command to Joel sit that play it shows us the number of uh, packets received in IPv6 and IPv4 and the successful uh, state of uh, the translation and everything that originated in IPv6 and IPv4 and that was and uh, was translated and uh, the ping goes on and again we can look at this it continues to to grow 71 77 uh, 94 so that shows that the translation is being implemented executed successfully but so far what we did was just to look at the commands three commands to make that work we pinged and but we haven't done anything interesting so far so we're going to have access to our web server in ipv6 i'm going to access through ip but still it has a domain name 54 c8 30 ip slash six uh, minus six uh, uh, four two thirty four two Listo. Este es nuestro servidor. This is our server, our web server, in IPv6 only. ¿Cómo yo sé que es en IPv6 only? How do I know that it's IPv6 only? IP address show. ¿Qué es que tenemos de IPv4 ahí? What do we have of IPv4 there? Just a loop back um, uh, address of 027, etc., etc. We don't have any more IPv4 in this web server. And let's see how magic occurs. There you can test. Let's try together. Voy a hacer aquí un dig en Here, let's uh, dig in an address in a domain that is IPv4 only. <laughs> Telecom, is, um, telecom ISP Solutions. Here I have an A entry for that domain name, IPv4 only, that uh, uh, Telecom ISP Solutions. Let's try with uh, Quad A to see whether some whether IPv6 comes out. No, there's no IPv6 coming out. That address, that IPv4 only telecom ISP dot solutions is hooked to an I, a public IPv4. 143.255.140.89. That's a public address that is in the border router, the VR of our lab. It's in this router. And it is here that it re-addresses the ports to IP 25018. Because here we have a private IP. Now let's pin to IPv4 only dot telecom ISP dot solutions. There we have the ping. And let's, we are going to see here whether we have an increase in the packets received by the Joel. We, we have an increase in the packets. Let's see here. I don't have the TCP download. Uh, TCP dump. Now, it's going to take too long. The ping works marvelously. Now, there's another domain name that we can try. That domain name is IPv6 only. 
dot telecom isp dot solutions that already has a quad a entry and it has no a entry the quad a entry is 28 uh, oh, 84 54 c age 34 uh, colon, colon, two that curiously it's a web server so what we are doing here actually is exactly what do you have in this chart what is ipv6 connects directly to the web server and ipv4 crosses through the relay border and so we can also try the ping IPv6 only dot telecom ISP dot solutions. It tells me that there's no ping because there's no IPv4 assigned, but if I give it a ping 6, it works. And here we are going to see somebody is trying to have access there what we are going to do now is a test let's access these two addresses through the web browser to see whether anything opens IPv6 only I invite you with your computers if you if you want to try that uh, in your computers ipv6 only dot uh, um tel com solu dot solutions and the other one ipv4 only telecom uh, isp dot solutions tenemos aquí dos direcciones web estas dos direcciones we have two web addresses that were set up so to enable us to see that different addresses can be configured for the same domain name. I can create an A entry or a quad A site of my company dot uh, IMX uh, entry A and quad A. Quad A for IPv6 directly from the web server and uh, entry A to the border relay that will be responsible for a translation process. Let's see. What I did here was to edit that page. Index. For you to see that I edited only one page, only once, and we're going to update IPv4 only and uh, IPv6 only. That is, is it's uh, transparent for the client uh, that is with IPv4 that is really having access to a web server and IPv6. Uh, and uh, if you disable IPv6 uh, in uh, your computers and you try to access IPv6 only, you won't manage. And if you try in IPv4 only, you will have access. But please, I beg you, sincerely, not to disable IPv6. Opening a new parenthesis, well, and by the way, 
some ISPs, when they have problems of uh, sites and destinations, the first reaction is to disable IPv6 uh, and to or decommissioning all the configurations. Uh, don't do that. No, Aga. No, es ese el Don't do that. That's not our aim. Our aim is to increasingly popularize IPv6 for users with the ultimate aim that users may have access to IPv6 in the internet so that we can increase the traffic, the number of users, and the contents in IPv6. The more times we can dis we disable and decommission everything and uh, that sort of things, the longer it will take us to reach an IPv6 network that is fully functional. It's obvious that the recipe to have a completely functional IPv6, uh, uh, especially in the last uh, mile, uh, the end, uh, is to do everything, all the tests and everything in IPv6 before delivering it to the uh, users. That is building a test uh, um, environment and conduct all the tests possible to guarantee that it's fully functional. And if you do that, then you're going to be giving a successful service. Preguntas hasta aquí? Any questions so far? No, nada. Creo que ustedes. I think that you're rather sleepy. Lunch was good, wasn't it? The mic, please. The OS that you had for the server, which was was a Debian. I use Debian 10, 11. That's wonderful for that. But uh, you can use any uh, of those recommended by Drew. They recommend, and there you have the, the entire tutorial. Let's explore that site now that, as we have time, Joule GitHub. GitHub. Let me see whether I can share the screen. Joule. Here at the website, you have downloads, how to download, how to install, and in documentation, we have uh, installation in Debian and its derivations in Ubuntu, Alpine, uh, OpenSUSE, OpenWRT, and the basic tutorials of SIT and SIT to C. It is from here that I gave, uh, took my presentation. Obviously, I changed uh, things now and there. I added uh, some uh, sketches to make it more understandable, some additional text. But basically, the tutorial is, is what you have here. And here you have everything of SIT and also SIT-COM AEM. And it works marvelously. Have, has anybody tested uh, Joule for any other presentation? Uh, who already knew uh, Joule? Uh, of course, my my students have already heard about it. But the people in Mexico, who who here is from Mexico? Who's a local? Okay, and how many of you had already heard about Joule? So you were wasting uh, a Mexican beauty. Jordi has some uh, implementations on Joule, right? Jordi has a lot of implementations running uh, with uh, uh, Joule, and th they run beautifully. It's a Mexican uh, export. It's open source, and it's beautiful. So I invite you to put together the labs with Debian or Ubuntu, what distribution you consider interesting, whatever, you can um, 
put it together there. And the most interesting thing is that they are open. They have a discussion list where they answer any doubts you may have. So you can register in the list and send your email address, and there the developers will solve uh, your doubts about its implementation. Now, since we are talking about uh, Joule and uh, we have time to spare, let me tell you about 464XLAT. It is here in this virtual machine. 464XLAT, let me tell you that from my point of view, it's the best transition technique for IPv6 at present. Now, for the majority of ISPs, the difficult thing is to obtain CPEs that have native 464X LAT support. In fact, you can install open DRT and have the support. Now, most of the CPEs, when they install third-party open WRT, you lose much of the Wi-Fi quality and the stability and speed. And with the standard firmware, you can transfer 200 and 300 megabits per second in a wireless network with 5 gigahertz and uh, Wi-Fi with good scope. But when you go to open WRT, this can drop considerably. So many ISPs don't think it's interesting to install that. But ISPs that already have native support for 464X LAT, in fact, some ISPs uh, while, uh, for, for a cable vendors find this option uh, good. Now, the user's CPE, in this game, in case you have an open DRT, the user will only have, let me enlarge this, the user receives in his home connection only IPv6. Now, the user still has devices that are IPv4. So how can we make these devices have the capacity to browse 464XLAT through CLAT will forward the IPv4 packet over the IPv6 network to the PLAT, which will be in charge of doing the translation. In this scenario, by default, in an IPv4-only network, we were going to have a NAT on this side in the CPE in IPv4 and another NAT in the BNG, in the CG NAT or anyone else. Now in 464X NAT, that NAT does not exist. Traffic is encapsulated to the PLAT and the PLAT does have a NAT between IPv6 to IPv4 which allows the user to continue having access to IPv4 content. So this is a very interesting implementation. In fact, it has had successful deployments in the region. Some deployments are still growing, and hopefully more and more ISPs decide to do tests with 464XLAT. So, it's interesting to do these types of tests and also to put pressure on the ISP vendors so that they more and more include support to 464XLAT in their CPEs so that we can use the CPEs with a native firmware and without having problems of reducing capacity of the firmware or of the routers with a firmware that is not the original one of that CPE. So with that, an additional point, and many people ask me, well, what if I use 464 SexLAT and CGNAT? Wouldn't that be the same? And it's not the same thing. CGNAT 
you will still have at least two nats. In 464x lat, you won't. In CG nat, you will continue using a lot of IP4. In 464x lat, optimization is to force as far as possible the use of IPv6. So IPv4 traffic will be done in IPv4. So what implementation is the simplest to use for last mile implementations? This is a dual stack. This is the easiest one. Dual stack with CGNAT is the easiest one, but it's not the most interesting one when we speak about saving IPv4 addresses. Now, who, I ask once again to all of you, who of those of you who are here have your own IPv4 addresses, uh, resources, sorry, IPv4 resources from LACNIC? And who have ob of you have obtained this over the past three years? IPv4 that you obtained in the recent in the last four years well okay good you really reached the end because in march 2020 march or april the ip4 addresses at lacnic were exhausted and what we have now and the approved requests enter in a very very long queue and the foreseen delay is 2029, seven years from here. So I don't know if you're willing to wait so long. I would say that is not the case because you still wish to continue expanding your networks and there's only one way forward, implementing IPv6. There's only one way forward. Now, a show of hand, who has here the IPv6 assignments and are using IPv4 of the carrier of the IP transit? Let's see, one, two, three. So that is how you can survive. Well, a good question. And who has implemented IPv6 without IPv4? Without IPv4. IPv6 only. So IP for only ah. So the purpose of these tutorials that we organize is to encourage you to implement IPv6, and in fact, we also encourage you to encourage those who haven't yet registered in LACNOG's mailing list. Well, another question, show of hands. Who hasn't registered in LACNOG's mailing list? Who is not registered? Oh, you're all registered in LACNOG's mailing list? Who doesn't know what LACNOG is? Who does not know what LACNOG is? LACNOG is the working group on network engineering for our region, for Latin America and the Caribbean. And the LACNOG mailing list is a great list, a very interesting list where we share information, we clarify doubts. At LACNOG, we have task forces focused on IPv6. So if there are any questions regarding IPv6 implementation, you can express your doubts, your questions in that list so we can all learn together about your scenarios and also share knowledge with the aim of helping you may have successful deployments. So that's interesting. So any further questions? Let's see, who was able to access IPv6 only? Let's see, one, nobody, did nobody else try? One, two, three, four, great. Uh, and about, what about IPv4 only? 
IP for only dot telecom dot ISP dot solutions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did you also try the ding? Great. How much time do we have? We still have time, so let's make the best of the time we still have. I will share with you the following, now that we have time left. I will share with you some of the slides I showed in the presentation I made in the other conference room, in case you were unable to go there. This content is about peering and IPv6. You can download the slides, too. I think this is in like Peering's forum site. And speaking about peering in IPv6, this is an interesting topic because many ISPs continue to grow. I heard that people did not have IP before and wish to continue growing. So IPv6 implementation becomes urgent. This is so that we can continue to grow. This is because of the development, the evolution of the ISPs and that the needs the clients have to have connectivity. But if we only are concerned about implementing IPv6 in the users but are not worried about establishing good connectivity or good interconnections, it might occur that we might be offering an IPv6 service of a worse quality compared to IPv4. Now this might happen. Well. That could happen. Let me give you an example. I have a Ferrari and I would like to go from here to Cancun. Let us assume that in the route I wish to take from here to Cancun, although I have a Ferrari, I have two possibilities, two different I have options, a wide highway with perfect in perfect conditions with no potholes at all and a beautiful highway. And then I have another road which does have tolls and all the rest. And then I have another option, um, very bad road in poor conditions. It's a mud road and it's two-way traffic and with a lot of trucks. Now, what do you think will be the option to reach destination faster? So although I have to travel the same distance along the two ways, I will travel slower because along the bad road, it's full of potholes. I have traffic in both directions. So it's full of trucks. And the same thing happens when we have good connections, good peerings, good interconnections in IPv4, and have only one BGP session with only limited number of policies or the minimum amount and with the IP carrier just to comply with the requirement given to me by LACNIC to have a BGP session. LACNIC says you have to have a BGP session 
and have your IPv6 resources within a given period of time. So IPv6 is our Ferrari. And in fact, it has a simpler header, it has no packet fragmentation, it has a whole set of advantages. However, we are making the IPv6 go along a very poor road. That is why it is also very important to pay attention to the IPv6 connections. This will allow us to provide better quality service to our users. That is the reason why we get uh, the users pay their contributions. They don't pay toll for a poor a road in poor conditions. And we have basically we have two classes of peering, the public and the private peering. These two types of peering sound interesting because they can meet the needs, meet our needs, our basic interconnection needs. In the public peering, basically, this is a connection to a traffic exchange point, and in that uh, IXP, I can either share or send uh, or advertise or my uh, blocks, uh, I can announce them there, and I also receive everything coming from that IXP. And so my networks are known publicly by all the participants, and that is why it's called public peering. The public peering, basically, as I was telling uh, people in the other room, that's what we do in one of these LACNIC events. Here we are sharing information publicly, you share your doubts, and all of us can interact together for the benefit of all, for mutual benefit. However, when we speak of private peering, that type of peering is more specific where two operators, two ISPs, for instance, can uh, extend their own fiber just to share traffic between them, or maybe participating of an IXP using tools that uh, had been previously offered by, by that IXP for private peering. What kind of uh, tools would that be? For instance, a layer two tunnel between the two users sharing uh, pre-existing infrastructure of an IXP, a VLAN, for instance. These two users will be able to establish BGP sessions using this private VLAN and hence close the peering. It can also be done through communities. I send a certain community, and for that community, I inform that only a certain participant will receive the announcements that uh, will continue with that community. BGP community are sort of ID tags that are announced in uh, the advertising advertisement and to optimize the routing policy. Here, we are going to reinforce the, the peering policy part because uh, regular BGP sessions are already well known by most of you. And you already know, for instance, how to establish BGP sessions with uh, the happy transit for exporting your own resources. However, you need to understand that the routing policies for peering may be a bit different. Let me give you an example. The BGP will always try to pick the best routes. However, we can also manipulate for these routes or the routes received by uh, traffic exchange point may always be the best routes possible from our point of view. That is something that we do in the route map. That's the route map concept. In route map, we apply or we execute actions in certain prefixes. And where are those prefixes? In the prefix list. That's the simplest way you can do routing policy politics. We have the prefix list that are lists of prefixes or lists of ranges. They may be our own ranges or ranges of third people. 
why third party because yes because we can manipulate how we are going to install our uh, these uh, uh, in our own router and so we use the prefix list to select to pick those ranges so in a prefix list we can identify or specify our ranges and in the route map what are we going to do in the route map we're going to define the action to be executed in that list of prefixes a list of prefixes can be illustrated as a, a as a shopping list uh, for instance i can tell someone i'll go to the drugstore and bring rice uh, beans potatoes milk and uh, apples and uh, other uh, fruit so i can ask somebody else going somewhere else to the drugstore for instance and to bring some drugs some uh, uh, beauty uh, products so the prefix list are shopping lists a, a curious detail is that the items in these lists may be present in other lists that is the same item may be present in different lists and i can also request the person who's going to the drugstore to buy a toothbrush and a person to go to the supermarket to buy the same thing and that is what happens with the uh, with a prefix list uh, that we can have the same networks in different prefix lists regardless of the type of action that we are going to have an interesting detail of the prefix list is always announcing the ixps also what you are advertising the dress and people tend to announce to advertise 22 to transit and 24 in ip before to the ixp and 40 to the ixp however it is interesting to optimize so that the networks um, um, may be in the best routes so it's important always to announce the same and why because we mu I might have connectivity with IXPA and I may be participating in an IXP I announce 32 to IXPA and I announce uh, 40 to the IXP however that transit provider all wants to optimize its routes and to make the most of the IXP and it again announces the IXP everything I announced them so he's going to send me to the IXP a 32 and I sent a 40 now for the rest of the participants there they'll always prefer 40 because it's a most specific network however if some of these participants for instance has limits in the border routes uh, and says well i only want to receive uh, 32 networks what will happen that participants in order to reach us will go to the ixp will loop through the transit and come down until they reach us instead of going directly through the IXP. So there we are not making the most of the IXP because that traffic is going through our transit. So this is a funny thing um, that uh, we have learned with time and it's important for us to share. A funny fact now speaking of route maps the actions to be executed in a certain prefix list basically there are two types of route maps export and import in the exports route map we send everything is that's not interesting and is of our own asn with the exception of epitransit there we could have to announce everybody who is under our network cone to an ixp and in the case of imports we can accept everything or just some communities 
that is a personal election of each network administrator and each network. However, it is interesting to assign a local preference, a, a, a higher local preference for the announcements received uh, by the IXP. And then we have the question again, but why? teacher, can that happen? Let's assume that, again, I buy transit from company A, and they advertise all their networks, including their own. However, the company also advertises their networks to the IXP, and in the case there are no restrictive filters there. If I, I'm, I'm a member of the IXP, if I have a higher local preference, the routes from this participant, the path, the preferable route will go through the IXP and not directly through that, because we have, we're leaving from us to the transit and from then to the transit that then is a participate uh, participant of the IXP. So that optimizes our yield and we can make the most of the IXP. Here we have an example of a li list of prefixes in Cisco uh, Lite, but in Huawei or Juniper, the commands may change, but the concepts are the same. Here you have ConfT, IPv6 prefix, list, uh, list peering out, V6, uh, 5 permit, 2001, DB8, and I put there, uh, slash 32, I put my IPv6 block. If I wanted to advertise 32, 33, 34, I'm only going to have to add new sequentials, 6, 8, 9, and so on. I always like to go from five to five, but that's my personal preference. Just as the name, the description of the prefix list here it says list peering out version six. Just with a look at that uh, prefix list, I know exactly that it's a prefix list, that it is related to peering, or that it could be IXP Yucatan, IXP uh, this or that. A BR or out, that's a prefix list that I'm using in the exports policy. And V6 is means it's IPv6. So it it's not really necessary because here we have, it says that it's an IPv6 prefix list, but uh, I don't know, they configured, uh, I, I, I've already configured uh, this for 15 years and that's the way I always put it. In the case of the route map, the same applies. ConfT route map RM peering out V6, uh, and there I'm stating that it's um, uh, RM of route map peering. It's where that route map is configured out V6 permit five, and from there I I put match IPv6 address prefix list list peering out V6. Here, this is a permit rule, and this, here, I am linking the prefix links created in the previous slide. I'm linking it to this route map. Equally, this other route map, RM peering in V6. That is, that route map will be implemented in my rules, in my inbound uh, rules. Permit five, set local preference 110. There, I'm giving um, this uh, 110 preference, but in the case of standard Cisco, it could be 101 because the local preference by default, uh, Cisco's uh, BGP uh, is 100. And 10. So all the routes received are installed with a local preference 10, 100. And there we have the end result, RASN123, established a private peering with ASN456, 
and decided to export to ASN 456 its blog, 2001 DB8, uh, colon, colon, slash 32, and decided to import everything and wants everything to be received uh, prefer with a preference of 110. If they don't want to import everything, they just have to create a prefix list stating the ranges that you don't want to accept. And in the route map, instead of permit, you put uh, deny. If I change the action of the route map automatically, the way I receive these uh, uh, routes will be changed. Jose? And with ASN 456, I might know this after the established BGP session, once I get a show command to sue the received routes. So I will then know what the sent ranges are. And in the import policies, I assume that it also wishes to apply local preferences 110 to the incoming routes. So in these cases, regardless of whether here at the top we have IP traffic, which is common to the two, here I have IP traffic and I am connected and this one is also connected and I announce to them the same as what I announced to the traffic. I am avoiding that traffic to because this will event because it will just have one hop. So some final considerations regarding IPv6 peering. An ISP that decides not to do good peering in IPv6 is a person that has a Ferrari and decides to travel to Cancun along the bad road, even though they have the option of traveling along the highway. And instead, they chose to travel along the road full of potholes. So ultimately, this is an issue of personal election. However, each choice we make has its outcomes, has its consequences. As a consequence, we might take longer to reach Cancun. We might break a tire. The Ferrari might break down completely because it wasn't built to travel along such roads. So these are the consequences of the decisions we make. So if an ISP decides not to do peering, that ISP is deciding not to provide the best connectivity to its users and not to deliver their best service and not to deliver what the user has contracted, has hired. They don't hire internet services so that it works slowly and so that it crashes and so on. They hire the services so that this works properly. So this is not about having the very best quality. You have an obligation and as ISP to offer the best quality. So adopting IPv4 or IPv6 peering is essential to reduce latency, to bring contents closer, to reduce costs, and also to provide the best quality of service to the users. So we do have consequences if we decide to do things differently. But if we decide to do things properly, we can really make the most of all these advantages that we have mentioned today. So any questions regarding peering and IPv6? So I will ask the questions. Go up to the microphone, please. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. In the case you mentioned of IPv6 only, please state your name and where you come from. Eduardo Rivera from Cabase, Argentina. 
My question basically is what you mentioned, that it would be ideal to implement IPv6 only and otherwise the two services. Now these, in fact, I have two questions. If we put Joule, that server, all the IPv4 traffic will go through that server. No, in the case of Joule, all the traffic, which is NATed, will go through there. So let me check, go here. What we have in this case, in the case of 464X LAT, traffic, the IPv4 traffic is encapsulated, goes this way and then goes up to the border. IPv6 traffic that is native will go directly to the border. So in that scheme, that server that you put at the bottom how can I estimate the capacity I need? In the Joule website, there, is, there are a couple of tests that they carried out regarding capacities to determine how much traffic with what hardware. And you can also send an email to the Joule mailing list and they can help you out. And LACNOG's mailing list, if you send an email to them, there you have Henry Godoy from the University of Campinas, who's a great friend and always willing to help. And he implemented Joule at the university. So has the entire traffic at the university going through 464XLAT through Joule. And he can tell you what hardware he uses, how many users he has. And I can tell you these are thousands of users because you have the students, the faculty members, the entire university goes through that hardware. And do you have any hardware at this time that is not a PC that uses Joule? Well, not with Joule, but for 464X LAT, you can find Cisco, Junipia, I haven't tried Huawei, so I cannot guarantee this. And then others that also use 464 slat. F5, yes. That includes Joule in the devices. Well, not Joule but the implementation of 464X LAT. One of the other things regarding peering, this would also help when you have small ISPs that have a slash 24, limited to a slash 24, so this would help to balance out traffic. If you only have a slash 24, well, you don't have much ways of balancing out the traffic based on origin, but you will have traffic preferences if you announce this to the traffic exchange point. But picking up uh, a peering in IPv6, well, in the case of an IPv6 peering, yes, in that case, you'll have a whole set of ranges, and then you can do the load balancing for the traffic, and this will depend on the range you announce and how these uh, users are announcing the ranges. But in the case of picking up just one peering in IPv6, can I take out the IPv4 traffic through that peer? In pure and simple BGP, did you mention today IPv6 today that can use IPv4? It's included in this morning's presentation. Yes, you can have BGP sessions in IPv6 and announce IPv4 through IPv6 sessions. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Wesley, we have three questions we received through Zoom. This is from Jorge Gonzalez. What would be the option for those cases in which the ISPs who have direct connection do not offer BGP? That's a great question, Jorge Gonzalez, and thank you for following us, for joining us remotely. Well, the answer to that question is something that I have been working on with some ISPs that sell IP traffic, and this is that they also deliver IPv6 
to their clients. So in the case of an ISP purchasing a dedicated service that does not only require a slash 29 or 28 in IPv4, but at least requires a slash 40 in IPv6 to their ISP that has a whole set of IPv6 addresses in their range and can deliver this without any inconveniences at all. So in that case, yes, if you take that block of the ISP, you can then use it to implement your users and they will have native IPv6 connectivity without any issues at all. Thank you for your question. Then we had a comment from another vendor that supports 464X LAT. Mayorga Elias asked a question on the topic of the RAs in BGP. What method do you have to counteract attacks on this service? Well, I don't know if I understood the question properly. RAs and BGPs. One of the policies that NIC Brazil has is that the participants have to have the neighbor discovery disabled in those interfaces where they establish peering. This is precisely so that the route server and the IXP network do not receive any RA and NDs, etc. So this could be a detail to disable the neighbor discovery in the interface where the BGP is taking place. Because if these are global IPv6 addresses that have been configured manually and statically, there's no point in having a neighbor discovery set up and announcing RAs. That is if I understood your question properly. Well, I'm going to expand on this concept because I think this is linked to the presentation I made this morning. What occurs with the RAs, PGPs, and what we discussed today, and what has been defined in the RFCs that we mentioned, 8950 and another one. The mechanism begins exchanging RAs. In other words, this is mandatory. This is the way in which a router that is going to be able to speak with other routers that are in the middle. Now, the question is linked to security and RA. Now, what happens in this case when a router, routers that receive us in the Wi-Fi network are going to be send us RAs con constantly every five minutes? Now, there's no specific time for this. The, some vendors send it every four minutes, every four minutes and a half, every six minutes, but others might be longer. But the thing is that these RAs are sent out constantly. Now, traditionally, what Wesley was saying is that if you are connected to an AXP, for example, what normally would occur is that the RA is eliminated. So they don't need to send RAs because there are no devices in the middle that need to listen to it. They don't need to do auto configuration, etc. Now, in these cases, if I want a d this to be automated, I have a data center. I'm speaking about a physical option, and if I wish to automate dozens and hundreds of devices that are going to speak BGP with me, this mechanism that was described this morning is very convenient because it allows to pick up BGP sessions in a very efficient way and without much maintenance. So eliminating RA is not an option. If I eliminate the RA, another option I have is to go to manual configuration. You can do this automated with a script behind. Otherwise, you have to do it device by device and maintain it and include the filters, which is a lot 
of work, administratively speaking. So I mentioned RA, this would be mandatory for those mechanisms we saw this morning. Now we have here some more questions. The last question, because the first one Mr. Rosrige Osmani says, if the traffic exchange points have a cost or are there some that are free of charge? Well, there are free traffic exchange points. Some are free and others are non-profit. The compared to the free ones are free and those that are non-profit you have to make small contributions in order to pay the operation costs of a traffic exchange point. And usually these are low costs and uh, it all depends on the size, uh, how, how large the connectivity bridge uh, port that you are using, uh, 10 giga, 40, 100 giga, there are XPs with 25 giga, others with 400. So that contribution will depend, the fees will depend on the amount of traffic you are using. And there are also IXPs that are for pay, uh, where you have to pay to participate. In most of our region, the IXPs, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a very good presentation today, this morning of the guys of the IXPs in Laka Tiefa. Uh, in most uh, uh, IXPs are either free of charge or uh, non for uh, non-profit. This would be the last question because it's uh, time for a coffee break. Good afternoon. I'm Ernesto Golon. I'm also from Cavase, the Argentine Chamber of the Internet. And based on what you just said, I wanted to announce to our colleagues that at the break or uh, these days, we can tell you the experience of Kavase building the 30 IXPs, collaborative uh, IXPs that we have in Argentina. For Certainly, we would love that, no doubt. So it's coffee break time. We'll come back at 4.30 sharp for the end. We are going to speak of Gid, uh, Gip, uh, Gipon. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. So please come back at 4.30.